and works towards the cause of rights and protection of the transgender community. Vajanti Mala, Vajanti Vasanta Mogli. Joining Vajanti is Satyasiri Atlururi, who is properly known as Siri. Siri is a young feminist lady lawyer in Hyderabad practicing in the High Court. And as a true friend of the transgender community, she has been offering her services, legal services, totally pro bono. She does not charge them at all. Siri was instrumental in getting the acid attack and gang rape transgender survivor, Sonia Sheikh, justice and compensation. Thanks to Siri's effort, GO9 of the government of this state of Telangana is all set to die its death very soon. Hopefully the verdict will come in the High Court. Joining them is Isabel Saldana. She is an artist, poet, teacher, lover, learner. She curates film and conversations on sexualities and genders it, with Anveshi Research Center for Women's Studies. Hopefully, joining them, the three out here, would be Chandramukhi Muwala. She's running a little late. She too is a transgender activist. She's a dancer and actor. She's one of the founding members of Telangana Hijra Intersex Transgender Samiti and has been passionately involved in human rights and gender equality advocacy. If you all have seen the very popular Telugu film, Nene Raja, Nene Mantri, you would have noticed Chandramukhi in that film. She performed along with Rana and Kajal Agarwal. Hopefully she is here to deliver a 10-minute dance performance. Over to you, Vajanti. Is that Mona Lisa? Mona, you'll see. Okay. Would you need a mic? I don't know if she is here. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? If you can't hear me. Okay, great. Um, Unfortunately, we had someone else coming to do a poem, but that person is, has gotten food poisoning. So I'll read a poem that um, I wrote when I was struggling um, with how to still hold on to my femininity while also embodying this gender of being non-binary. Um, so I'll share that with you now. Posterior botany. Grow a garden on my back. Drag your teeth through the dirt. Till me till you hit my ribs. Put a pond at the small of it. Make it hard to touch me there. Be careful to make it look wild, colorful. Here, let me pick. Marigold, demaga, some type of orchid. Don't make it too, too dull. Plant calla lilies, hydrangeas. They don't have to go. The clematis can climb my neck. And as you grow baby's breath near the sunflowers on my shoulders, even if it doesn't make sense, I'll feed them all. Even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's past midnight and the sun is coming and the food I'm cooking was supposed to last two more weeks, I'm used to filling many mouths, waiting for them to sprout. Let this garden overgrow. Please, I beg you not to tend it. It needs neglect. It needs to be alone with itself, to get tangled up. It has a fear of being touched while naked. And anyways, wash day will water it, and my acrylics will rake room for new growth. And when it's full, overflowing, bursting from my vertebrae, I'll make a mountain of my back, bend my knees and dip my head, dig my fingers in till I hit my ribs, Grab all of the roots, hold them, like friends who hate to sleep alone. So when you cut it all down and turn me over to the winter, I'll know how to keep them whole and warm enough to bear their blooms again. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hi. So my name is Sayantan. I am a student in the University of Hyderabad. I identify as a gender non-conforming person, and um, I am grossly unprepared. But um, the poems that I'm going to read were first performed as a part of the National Queer Conference that was held by Safo for Equality in 2017. I'm just trying to get them out. So these are a bunch of untitled poems mainly. So the first one. Growing up, I realized how to be a woman, but not act like one because to be a woman in a world which benefits from you not being one is to transgress martyrhood altogether. To be a martyr is to love oneself. And to love is to resist. To resist is pain, or they make you feel like it is. Pain comes off as an interesting trade-off, a virtue to fuck across genders, to make a poem out of bodies to be read and distorted by who did that to us. I'm, I'm sorry. Give me a second, please. Pain to be sold is to caress and behold, to unsettle capitalism through gamchas and love underneath. Pain as virtue, a hubris committed, demanding to be understood, felt only by you. Sympathy is an asterisk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sayantan, and thank you, Isa. So we'll set the tone of the panel discussion now. Um, and you have our introductions. Uh, I'm Vajanti Vasanta Mowgli, and I'll largely dwell upon the socioeconomic uh, uh, lived realities of transgender people in India. Um, so mo as most of you know, um, as some of you may know, perhaps not all of you, this is my school. This is the school where I studied. I have some memories, and many of them are not very pleasant. As a gender non-conforming child, while this school was um, part of my formative years, it also stands out in my memory as an epicenter of structural violence. I'm talking about early 90s. I've written extensively about this. This was covered by Deccan Chronicle and Indian Express. Early 90s were not a time when ragging was criminalized. Ragging was first criminalized in 1997 when Pon Navarasu was brutally lynched to death. Being the child of a vice chancellor, that's when the state of Tamil Nadu for the first time criminalized ragging. It, it, it was only in 2001 when ragging got criminalized pan-India by a, a historic judgment of the Supreme Court. Um, I'll talk about six themes very briefly, as my time is limited. Family and childhood. Childhood and family for transgender people are um, not with acceptance. Unlike children who are born into repressed classes or castes, where when they face discrimination and violence and when they go back home and talk about it with their parents, their parents are more or less able to understand it because a child from a repressed caste is typically born to a parent of a repressed caste. That's quite not the case with uh, gender non-conforming children because our parents are not necessarily transgender. So the structural exclusion, stigma, begins at home. Most transgender children, most gender non-conforming children, my apologies, run away from home or they're thrown out of their homes. Moving on from family to education. Places of education, schools and colleges, again, happen to be cesspools. You know what I mean by cesspools, confluence of sewage and gutter. Cesspools of structural violence and um, stigma for gender non-conforming children. Um, as education, as children are bereft of education at an early age, they're also stripped of employment and livelihood opportunities, and that's quite visible in India, with the only two sources of livelihood in India being begging and sex work. 
This is not limited to a few transgender people. This is a universal phenomenon throughout India and across the world. Begging may not exist institutionally in other parts of the world, but sex work exists universally across the world. Moving on from there, we've touched upon family, education, employment, and livelihoods. Moving on to Medicare. Hospitals do not admit transgender people. When a transgender person accesses Medicare, interns and young doctors are called in by a senior doctor to take a look at the ambiguous genitalia of the transgender person, and we become subjects of debate, subjects of mockery as well. Things are changing, but at a very painfully slow pace. Many transgender people being dependent on begging and sex work are highly vulnerable to uh, sexually transmitted infections and opportunistic infections. Many transgender people who take hormone replacement therapy do not have the resources to undergo sex reassignment surgery, get crudely emasculated in very unhygienic conditions, and suffer urinary tract infections. And hospitals that do sex reassignment surgery, most of the doctors who do it now in India, they're not many, they're very few, mind you, indemnify themselves from the consequences of that surgery. They just take signatures on blank white sheets and indemnify themselves. That is, if the surgery goes well, it's because of the doctor's prowess. If it goes bad, it's because of the transgender person's bad luck. Don't, don't hold the doctor responsible. So signatures are taken on blank white sheets. Moving from Medicare to housing, Housing is a huge problem because uh, transgender people barely have their homes of their own, are dependent on communes, which are rented spaces. And if, say, a certain accommodation is worth a rent of 5,000, it's typically charged as 10,000 or 15,000 because there's myth floating in the minds of landlords and landladies that transgender people make easy money and quick money, oblivious of the fact of how sex work happens on the roads. People who come every day are not industrialists, not film stars, not capitalists who throw hundreds or even thousands or even hundreds of rupees. People are dependent on subsistence and poverty wages of 50 rupees, 100 rupees. Moving from here, medic, uh, from housing to public accommodation, public utilities, the last theme of my talk, is accessing restrooms and washrooms is a pain for most transgender people because we can't access male restrooms for the fear of sexual harassment. Imagine a person like me going into a male restroom. And we can't also comfortably access ladies' restrooms because women are not, most women, I wouldn't say all, but many women are not aware and feel very threatened. So where do we go? Right to sanitation? Mind you, is not a luxury. Is it a comfort? Is it a luxury? It's not. Right to sanitation is read into right to life, which is protected under fundamental rights. And right to sanitation is not available to transgender people. On that note, I'll pass it on to my colleague, lawyer colleague, Siri. Thank you, Vaijayanti. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, after hearing Vaijayanti's uh, talk about what are the socioeconomic problems that uh, transgenders face in India, uh, if you were not aware of them before, I would like to talk about what are the laws that protect or in fact do not protect transgender people in India. The 2011 Indian Census estimates the country's transgender population to be over 5 lakhs whereas trans activists declare that the number is much higher. While exact numbers continue to remain unknown, what is obvious is the degree of discrimination the community faces in attempting to secure the basic rights to life, safety, and livelihood. The first big step towards remedial measures came about in February 2014, when the Supreme Court of India, in what is known as the Nalsa Judgment, has held the right to self-identification of gender is part of the right to dignity and autonomy under Article 21, which is the right to life under the Constitution. The judgment gave broad directives to the central and state governments on affirmative action, public health, social welfare, and other services to be made available for transgender people. This was a revolutionary judgment, especially since it came just on the heels of um, the Kaushal judgment by the Supreme Court, which overturned the Delhi High Court judgment, decriminalizing Section 377. 
This judgment of the Supreme Court was followed by two bills on the same issue, a private member's bill on protection of rights of transgender people, which was, in an un which was an unprecedented move passed by the Rajya Sabha in April 2015. The second one was by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment's draft bill, which they made available for further considerations and consultations from transgender community, activists, and civil society. After receiving copious comments from the community and the civil society, the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Bill 2016 was approved by the cabinet. However, it is an utter travesty that intends to undercut the Nalsa judgment and to overstep the previous judge, the, the private member's bill which was passed by the Rajya Sabha. One of the most significant aspects of the Nalsa judgment was its expansive understanding of the transgender identity by, out, by how it embraced individuals who wanted to traverse the male-female identification binary and those who wanted to identify outside of it. The former version of the transgender bill, which is the private member's bill, honored this understanding through a broad definition that included those who identified themselves by gender other than the one assigned to them at birth. The definition affirmed the right to identify themselves as a man, woman, or transgender. The current bill, however, eliminates the option of identification as either male or female. On top of it, the bill reinforces stereotypes which are very injurious about transgender persons as being part male and part female. The def it's defined as someone who is neither wholly female nor wholly male, or a combination of female or male, or neither female nor male. Even though the Nalsa judgment has remained far from being ideally implemented, the principle of self-identification and its broad understanding of gender has opened a space for transgender persons to obtain documents that identify them by the gender of their choice. With this provision, the space stands to be firmly shut. The chap coming to chapter three of this bill, it goes on to provide a mechanism for the recognition of identity. This segment at least has the virtue of outlining a seemingly clear process. A transgender person may apply for a certificate of identity to the district magistrate, who will then refer the application to a district screening committee, which will issue a certificate of identity to the person. The process depicted in this part of the bill requires many bureaucrats in the screening committee to verify whether a person is transgender or not. This is worsened by the screening committees uh, involve also having a doctor who um, is to certify as to who is a transgender person. Not only does such a policy entirely ruin the sp spirit of self-determination, it also puts in place a surveillance and gatekeeping mechanism for an already severely discriminated against community. This certificate, which is given by the screening committee, will then be used uh, as a basis for recording gender in all official documents. The issue here is that providing for such an onerous procedure stands in violation of the self-identification principle itself. It is a mechanism that has been strongly contested by the community and by the civil societies. Transgender uh, groups argue that such a certificate could be used for specific process of channeling entitlement to individuals. However, to make it the very basis for otherwise recognizing transgender identity in any given document again, strikes at the heart of the Nalsa judgment. The next part of the bill says that no trans, and I quote here from the bill, no transgender person shall be separated from parents or immediate family on the grounds of being transgender, except on an order of a competent court in the interest of such person. So as Vaijanti started her speech by saying, that most of the violence in a person of non, in a child of gender non-conforming person happens or starts or begins at the family. So what happens if the violence comes from within the family? Nalsa had squarely recognized the family as a site of violence and discrimination, while this bill fails to acknowledge that. Waiting for the court's decision to rescue the victims in such cases is not an option, considering our judicial system. The jurisdiction of the Indian government doesn't, con doesn't cover life after one's death. The revised bill further says, where a parent or a member of his immediate family is unable to take care of a transgender, 
the, com the competent court shall by an order direct such person to be placed in a rehabilitation center. So look at the words, like rehabilitation center for a transgender person who is being uh, abused at home, right? But a quick fix like this, placing someone in a rehabilitation center is not appropriate. Any kind of detention, even if purported to be for the benefit of a person, is unacceptable. These sections, as I've just said, show the intention of the legislature that is, it is more about control and monitoring of transgender persons rather than providing or recognizing the rights that have been given to them under the Constitution and by the Supreme Court. It, seems like a very co it also seems like a very covert way for the government to go around the Telangana Unix Act, which is one of the, some of the similar acts which are there in other states also, but here we have the Telangana Unix Act, which is a barbaric vestige of the colonial era that criminalizes an entire section of the population which are transgender persons and also creates a book that is supposed to be kept in every police station of transgender persons living within that area. The next part of the bill states a few welfare measures, but again, without going into detail and makes no mention of provisions pertaining to reservation. Reservation and providing employment was, a part of, was an important part of the NALSA judgment. Other, in other incentives which were also provided in the previous bill were providing incentives to uh, private companies for employing transgender persons by giving them tax exemptions. This, bills, uh, this draft builds suspicious silence on accessing a broader series of rights of transgender individuals in their private sphere, such as marriage, inheritance, adoption, resembles a half-baked cake. It does not talk about any of the issues that the transgender person faces in their everyday life. Moving to the important question of recognition of discrimination, the bill once again falls short. The single section chapter, which is chapter two on discrimination, forbids discriminatory treatment across a number of spaces, including educational institutions, healthcare services, and employment. What it fails to do, however, is to provide a definition of discrimination to begin with. Without an understanding of what kind of discrimination transgender person faces in their everyday life, it would be ineffective in interpreting the duties that are imposed upon citizens and the government against discrimination. It only appears as a hollow admonishments to citizens. Rendering them further hollow is the truly baffling lack of enforcement provisions in this bill. This is a problem that has plagued either earlier iterations of the law as well, and even constant advocacy from civil society on this front seems to have left no mark on the government. There is simply no punitive mechanism in place or redressal mechanism in place as far as potential violation of the duty against discrimination is concerned. They do, however, exist a number of offenses co correlated with penalties that don't represent community needs. For instance, the bill criminalizes enticing a transgender person to indulge in the act of begging. And as Vaijanti has just told us, begging and sex work are the two main employment opportunities, not opportunities, but the transgender person that are that main source of uh, income for them is begging and sex work. This not only ignores the ground reality that begging is one of the few income generating options available to a large number of trans persons, but provides another avenue for the misuse of law. There have been a number of instances where transgender individuals have been disproportionately targeted under the general law relating to beggary. And significantly, it is silent on the count of police violence against the community which serves as an important reason why the community is relegated to the margins in India. With all these flaws, this, this draft bill was approved by the cabinet and the parliamentary standing committee has given its recommendations and its criticism of this bill. Hopefully, th those will be accepted. But as far as it is concerned today, we as civil society, the only suitable reaction for us to do is to greet it with contempt, the very sentiment that it seems to have been drafted with. Now I hand it over to Isa. So thank you both. Um, now that they've touched on the socioeconomic, political, and legal aspects um, of gender and community, I'm going to be focusing on the more personal um, journey that I've experienced um, in terms of gender. 
My flight was already scheduled past midnight. And after a long week of screaming sixth graders at the government school I teach at in Malik Pit, all I wanted to do was sit on the plane and sleep. But a one hour delay and lines at immigration checkpoint refused me any peace. When I finally got past the immigration desk, I had a choice in front of me. The men's line to the right, which had all of 11 people in it, or the women's line to the left, which was so long that it snaked around four times. I was feeling bold, and so I feigned ignorance about the separated gender lines and stuck myself in as number 12 on the right side of the division. At first, no one said anything. The line moved up, and some security guards noticed me, but they let me be. I started to feel a, gi a bit giddy about my own transgression, because I thought I might actually get away with it. And that's when someone, two people ahead of me in line, decided to take it upon themselves to inform the foreigner that they were in the wrong line. I tried to play it off. Oh, I didn't know. Well, I'm already here, so I've already been waiting. Like, just thank you. I'll just wait here. It's fine. Suddenly, it became an entire group effort of all of the men in line to try to get me into the correct line. They called over one of the officers who finally instructed me to move. As I huffed and puffed my way over to the, ends of the, to the end of the women's line, I, shamed, I felt shame as I joined them, and I felt internally frustrated that I was the only one who knew that I didn't belong there either. But before I could even process what I was feeling about this defeat, I noticed that any time the men's line would start to get long, the two officers at the front would, stopped at, would stop attending to the women's line and start checking only the men's passports. To be quite frank, this really pissed me off. And if you ask anyone who knows me, I hate stirring up trouble. I'm an eternal people pleaser, which is something that I'm working on in therapy. And I normally wouldn't do anything like this. But because the wound of my earlier failure was still smarting, I shouted out from the depths of the line, hello, can you please check the women's passports simultaneously? Not only the men have somewhere to be. After eliminating the remaining few men, the two officers obliged. 20 minutes later, I got to the front and saw that there were at least six metal detectors and luggage screeners open for men, and one of two available areas open for women. At that point, I was ready to scream. I complained again to the security officers and asked them if I could join another line. As long as I was fine with being screened out in the open, I, I thought that they were going to acquiesce when they moved the men out of one line and told women to start putting bags, their bags on the belt. And then they said we all still had to be screened behind the curtain. I made an audible sigh, and that's when the officers started int imitating me. I finally understood the phrase blood boiling anger in that moment. Following it, more mocking as the process went along, and not long after that mimicking began, a screaming match between myself and the various officers started. I won't recount the whole thing to you, but it ended with a threat to take me back to immigration and out of the country, and me walking away from the security line hoping that no one would come after me. As someone who frequently does not feel like a woman, as someone who is not a woman, moments like these reinforce for me the ways that I am constantly seen as a woman and treated as such. I don't pretend that this is the most marginalized position one can have in the infinite possibilities of genders, especially when trans women and trans feminine people are so vehemently targeted globally. But it is constantly disconcerting to know that almost all of the time, who you are and who people are assuming that you are are two different genders. I identify as non-binary, which is a gender non-conforming identity that for me is relatively fluid. I don't feel that I fit neatly into the box of woman or the box of man, or even on the line in between that binary. When I'm trying to explain being non-binary and trying to get it, over quick, get it over with quickly, I use the simplest explanation that I have available to me. 
Some days I wake up feeling like a boy, some days I wake up feeling like a girl, some days I feel like neither. The truth is though, that I don't know what it's like to feel like a girl or feel like a boy. I truly don't understand what that means. And I'm sure there, there are some people who know, but all that I know is that I feel good in both boxers and dresses, with my chest bound and hidden below a button down and with it bursting out of a cropped tube top. I've considered surgeries, and I've also decided against them. A few years ago, I didn't even know these things about myself. I grew up with a, I grew up with a cultural legacy where achievement was everything. Both of my parents, my father, who is Afro-Puerto Rican, and my mother, who is Chinese, were not born in the United States and grew up in financially poor situations. Though many cultures like theirs have had a rich history of gender diversity that colonization attempted to stamp out, that is not the legacy that I'm speaking of. Rather, their sacrifices to build a life for me that had more, that ensured that I would always have enough, meant that my focus had to be on academics, extracurriculars, and anything that would hopefully one day lead to success. That meant ignoring sexuality, ignoring gender, ignoring self-discovery if it wasn't integral to the next rung on the ladder. And I don't blame my parents for this. Their conditions growing up informed my own, and most of those were out of their hands. However, in my first semester at university, someone came out to me as queer. And as they were talking, I realized, oh, I'm queer too. And even though I knew gay people existed and that I did not suddenly find someone unattractive because of their gender, I had never had a community around me to help me put one plus one together. Since then, I've never come out to people in a formal way, but once I realized the truth and once I found other friends who were queer, that finally made me brave enough to start asserting and living out my own queerness. And a similar process happened with my gender identity. When I discovered a feminist community, I finally had words to put to the feelings I had about gender inequity. And as gender non-conforming and trans people began joining that community, I discovered the term non-binary. Of course, it again took me some time to put together that this was the term that suited me, that I did not have to accept that someone at some point who told me was a girl was, what, was who I had to stick with, but that I, in fact, had the power to create my own definition of who I was. And that's what's really interesting to me about people who claim that being non-binary or, non or any gender non-conforming identity is made up, unnatural, just done for attention. At the end of the day, we are constantly all making our own gender. We are all making up what it means to be a man, making up what it means to be a woman, and doing that. And what I'm basically trying to say is that community is the most important thing in forming what you decide to make as your own gender. Community acts as a sort of compass for us to realize all of the many possibilities that exist around us and all of the different directions in which we can travel. And so I will continue to fight to build community and find communities as long as it might help someone do what it did for me, which is exhale a breath I did not even know I had been holding in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isa, for that very power-packed, soul-stirring uh, performance and talk. Um, uh, as we have some time left, um, I call upon two people, uh, Manush, to read a passage on transgender people in Telugu. We need to be aware, Manak Telavals in the Intente, Angla me kaka, sirf angrezi hi nahi, yaha log, bohat sare aise log transgender log hai, jo angrezi nahi jante. English radu, Anglan radu. So, isiliye regional vernacular languages play a very important role. Please introduce yourself, Manush. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, this is Manush. I myself identify as a pansexual agenda person. 
Um, this is long poem written by Renuka Ayola on third gender people. I have a few lines. Janyu karana manukunna, puttuka lokappam anukunna, lopam shariram bhagam aina pudu, yakkadu nunji modulayindu teliyaka, prayana magaledu. Lopali sreeto, baita prepancham lo batkali anukunna pudu, a manishi kosam, a roopam kosam, yani maila ina, yalanti dura maina, nadavaka tappadu, ankuntu, dhairyapu godukuto, nilabadina prati sari, nu hijaravi, nu khodjavi, Matalu pilupulu kumpatilo raju kuntunna nipul ravala yegirutunna nipul laval ki godu ki inda shariram manusu chillulu parthuna sare nadavaka agaledu thank you this is few lines yes um, and thank you ma'am telugu lone maatladtanu koncham ardham avutund anukuntanu either hindi maybe me bol sakti hu me is पोएम लॉन्ग पोएम तेलुगु में मैं फर्स्ट वुमेन हूँ लिखने के लिए और कोई नहीं लिखा था तो इसको लिखने के लिए मैं तीन साल स्ट्रगल किया था तीन साल स्ट्रगल के बाद मैं ये बुक लिखने लिख पाई सो थैंक यू वेरी मच टू गिविंग मी अ ब्यूटीफुल अपॉर्चुनिटी थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू मैडम रेणुका यो लगा रू एंड अब मैं अपनी दो वेल इट्स माई अपॉर्चुनिटी डेट आई गॉट टाइम जस्ट चार लाइन ही बोलूँगी आई हैव अ पॉइंट विच आई रोट रोट ऑन माई ट्रांस लाइफ कि कैसा हुआ मेरी ट्रांस लाइफ में इट इज़ इन हिंदी पॉइंट बहुत बड़ी है बट आई विल जस्ट रीड डाउन द फर्स्ट फोर लाइन्स हिंदी में हाँ जी हिंदी में फ्रॉम अब अब फ्रॉम द स्काई डाउन फॉल टू द अर्थ वेन आई ओपन एस ट्रांस जब मैं बिल्कुल अपने आप को ट्रांस हिचड़ा घोषित की कैसे मेरा डाउनफॉल आया लाइफ में लुटा दी लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत बस अपनी एक पहचान बनाने को पहचान मीन्स जो मैं आज हूँ मेरी ट्रांस लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत बस अपनी एक पहचान बनाने को पहचान तो बना ली रहा ना साया दुख सुनाने को दिस इज जस्ट जब ट्रांस लाइफ में आ गए ट्रांस लाइफ में आने के बाद सोसाइटी के सामने हम कैसे आए जैसे वैजयंती ने भी मेरी बहन ने बताया आपको कि एक यूनिवर्सल फैक्ट्स हैं पहचान बन गई पहचान बनते ही पहचान बनते ही मुश्किल हुआ इस दुनिया को समझाने को पहचान बनते ही मुश्किल हुआ इस दुनिया को समझाने को मेरा शरीर शरीर है कोई सराय नहीं रात बिताने को पॉइम बहुत बड़ी है मगर टाइम बहुत कम है तो मैं यहीं एंड करती हूँ इस पॉइम का दिस वॉज द फर्स्ट टू पैराग्राफ है मुझ कोई हंसता है मुझ पर कोई हंसता है मुझ पर कोई रुलाता है मुझको दिस इज अ समथिंग ट्रू थी सच्चाई है जो मैंने अपनी माँ को मद्देनजर रखते लिखी है कोई हंसता है मुझ पर कोई रुलाता है मुझको कोई खुद मुझ पे रोया वो थी मेरी माँ जिसने एक पल ना दिया मुझे खुद को समझाने को लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत बस अपनी एक पहचान बनाने को लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत बस अपनी एक पहचान बनाने को पहचान तो बन गई रहा ना साया दुख सुनाने को ए संसार ए संसार अपना ले निर्वैर जैसी हर एक बहन को दिस इज़ अ मैसेज फॉर द वर्ल्ड ए संसार अपना ले निर्वैर जैसी हर बहन को वरना तेरे ही नाम पे हर कोई विदाई ले जाएगी लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत एक अपनी पहचान बनाने को लुटा दी दौलत और शहरत एक अपनी पहचान बनाने को पहचान तो बन गई रहा ना साया दुख सुनाने को क्योंकि मुझे लास्ट जो मैंने देख के रीड की थी एक साल से ऊपर हो गया थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू बजयंत So I think we have a few minutes to take a couple quick questions. Anyone? Yeah. Sure. 
just wanted to know from your perspective that like, what will it take for us to understand that before being a transgender or a female or a male, we are all human beings, so that we don't make that difference and it doesn't make that much sense to do so. So, I, I can repeat the question. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me now, everyone? Okay, I just wanted to know that uh, what will it take for us, everyone, to understand that before being a transgender or a female or a male, before that we are all, a, we are all human beings. So it doesn't make that much sense to have that discrimination. I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> I think people have been trying to figure out um, the answer to that question for some time. But I want to invite you to think about it a little bit differently because I think that a lot of us want to think we can't, let me rephrase, we can't ignore people's gender. Just like we can't ignore people's race and we can't ignore socioeconomic backgrounds and everything that makes us who we are because to ignore those things is to deny those people, um, whether they are coming from marginalized identities or privileged identities, is to take away their humanity, to take away who they are um, and how they experience the world. But I think the question is rather, how do we learn to accept people as they are and not question them or be invasive or um, degrade their choice of how they want to live or the things that are out of their choice, the way that they were born? Um, and so I think that that is really the question that we should be trying to find the answer to that I still don't have the answer to, um, which is how can we start to see all identities as valid? How can we start to see all identities as important and not in need of shame or to be hidden away? Um, and see those identities as a part of humanity as opposed to seeing humanity before identity. Does that make sense, sort of? Very, very succinctly, thank you so much, Isa. Very uh, briefly. The Supreme Court's uh, Nalsa judgment that our lawyer, friend, and colleague series spoke about was historic for many reasons, one of which was the fact that it separated. It separated gender from biological sex. It said what lies between the thighs of a person, whether that's a lump of flesh or an orifice, cannot and shall not determine a person's gender. That gender is way beyond a person's anatomy. That gender is way beyond a person's anatomy and a person's physiology. But I encourage you and invite you and thank you for asking this question and encourage all of you to work within your circle of influence. It may not be possible to boil the Atlantic Ocean with a gas stove. It's not. You can't. I cannot solution world hunger myself all alone, but I can definitely do my teeny weeny bit with my neighbors, with people who work at my workplace, with people, the, the, the domestic worker who works at my home. You know, these are people that I can immediately work with. So work within your circle of influence, thank you. I request all of you to ask your questions one after the other and we'll note them down so that all of you have an opportunity to ask questions and we also adequately address your questions with answers. So I have a question. This was to the one conversation that you spoke about in your first year where someone who was queer came to you and told you what they were going through and what they felt. And then you said that you agreed with them and you felt similar things that sometimes you woke up as a man and sometimes you woke up as a woman and sometimes you woke up as neither. And granted the fact that a lot of this is socially constructed in the sense that society defines what it means and non-conforming might just mean going against what society says is one. But did your feeling also, uh, is there something which you meant, which you felt, which was not about society, but something else about gender? I'm not sure if the question is clear, but is, there, is it something more than social, this thing? Or, and what do you mean when you say something like neither? And what are you not conforming to in some sense? So I think we're going to take all the questions, and then I'll come and answer them. Uh, Isabel, uh, I really liked your speech. Uh, it gave me a lot of insight into something which I'm not familiar with, really. But uh, one question that I have is, is convenience a factor which defines and which influences the identification of gender? I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm trying to ask, 
I'm trying to say that as a third party to this is we have, I mean, we as society at large, we have this feeling that convenience somehow influences the identification of gender. I'm not talking about, I'm not making a blanket statement, but uh, getting to the example that you cited of the immigration line, where you chose to go into the uh, male line, male line. So, uh, I mean, that's really not a gender issue there. It's something based on the rule of law and a, a, a rule there, basically. And you rebelled against that, which I'm totally fine with. But what I'd like to know is, how do you uh, get through to an outsider like me and convince us of the legitimacy of gender identity? I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Can, uh, do you want an, uh, you want to have all the questions first? Okay. See, my name is Pratyavanand Kumar. I'm a journalist and uh, an author. I have done a series of interviews with uh, transgenders and LGBT community. I have done a lot of uh, writings also on them. What you said just now made me ask this question. Uh, body is everything in, in a way. So like when they say a woman is her body, it can be defined in different ways also. And it's a political statement also. So, so it is for a transgender. Otherwise, you wouldn't have changed your gender. You know? So one cannot ignore that. What you said, you know, what is, what lies between the thighs defines you also. Hi, hello. Uh, I first want to congratulate all of you on the bravery of your stories and statements. Uh, where I come from, in the Middle East, we don't have a chance to have forums or conversations like this about specifically transgender and other LGBT-related conversations, so it's very, very brave and commendable that you guys have these talks. And my question goes into regards of the international infrastructure or treaties or organizations and civil societies that take place here in India, as in the problem mainly in the Middle East that prevents us from having these dialogues is the lack of infrastructure and the lack of the ability to have this actual conversation because it's complete neglect both constitutionally and legislatively. So I wanted to ask how it's a bit different here in India. What maybe would you say that infrastructure is that, or policies that have allowed you to be able to talk about these things and have these conversations? You've said that every day you wake up either fe feeling like a man one day or a woman the other and that you don't know which gender do you actually belong to and that you speak in with uh, other queer people and uh, understood that you are even one of them. Right now I'm figuring out which gender do I actually belong to. Even I have the same experiences. Once I feel I, like I'm a girl, the other moment I feel like I'm a boy. Uh, how do I uh, know uh, who am I, uh, like what can I call myself and, and also I'm scared that if I find out that I belong to the third gender, my family, my friends, they won't accept me, so. Reach the masses. So, my, so you spoke about how here in this very school you faced some sort of violence. So how do we take this uh, to spaces where, uh, you know, we reach students, we reach children? Because this is a space where it will be very limited. The scope of influence is really limited. So how do we, how do we translate, in, translate this into actionable, uh, you know, how do we take this to people who actually are learning in the process of learning and how do we make this normal? But uh, I have a question. Recently, I had seen a video uh, about a pediatrician from Ireland. He had said that uh, kids as young as 10 years are coming out as transgenders, that uh, they are going for surgeries and stuff. So they were saying that like, it's dangerous to go for a surgery at uh, such a young age. So I want to know, like, uh, at what age do you come to know that you're transgender? And, uh, one more thing is, Vaichanti ma'am had said that um, this uh, using of uh, washrooms is quite difficult for transgenders as uh, uh, they are, 
if they find it difficult to go into either male or female washroom. So, like, I want to know what's the solution for that because uh, they identify themselves as female and uh, suppose they start using the women's washroom, they, uh, this, uh, something like this can happen, right? Many men can come dressed up as women and take advantage of women. So I'm not saying anything against uh, you guys, but I'm just asking for a solution for this. Like, or there should be like separate bathrooms for transgenders or something like that. I just want to know your opinion on this. Thank you. Reverse chronologically with the last person. Um, you spoke of the minimum age of identifying gender dysphoria. There is no such minimum age. It differs from person to person. A child who's as, as young as six may say it very clearly. A 60-year-old may yet be figuring it out. So there is no such minimum age. The lived frame, the lived realities and the frames of references that are different for of each individual. Next, you also spoke of the washroom issue um, as to which washroom, which restroom would transgender people prefer. We are not Unitarian. Transgender community is not a monolith Unitarian community. There are people who clearly identify as women. There are people who identify neither as men nor as women. And there are people who do not want labels. And I'm just giving you three. But there are multiple points within the so-called quote-unquote endpoints of the spectrum. It's a continuum, and people should be free to self-identify and choose the washrooms they wish to go. It should, not, it should not start with a presupposition of crime, is my argument. No and yes. Because there are people who identify as agender and genderless. There are people who clearly identify as women. So I cannot put a label on those who clearly identify as women who say, how dare you call me transgender? I am a woman. I will transition as a woman. I will decide how much I transition. I do not have a locus standi. In law, there's a principle of locus standi for me to question. I do not have a locus to question someone else's self-identification of gender. So it will be a matter of debate, and that's how from this kind of critical engagement and debate will come out different perspectives, perspectives and insights. Now, I got requested to stand because I guess some people over here can't see me. Um, so the question I think next was about how do you know about your gender identity? Um, I think what I'm trying to get across is that some of us, we are all making it up all of the time, but some of us just have forgotten that we're making it up. We're just doing what we've been doing for so long that we're not aware of the fact that we're making it up. Um, and in terms of trying to figure out what you want to do to make your gender, I think the answer is community, which is a really like shitty answer sometimes because sometimes you don't have community and you don't know where to find community and you don't even know where to start. Um, and that's extremely difficult and I feel that because I've been there. Um, and the, but the best thing that trying to find community and trying to build your own communities can do for you is allow you to know what options currently exist to take and pull from those options in order to make something that feels right for you. And I'm happy to be a part of a, your community if you so wish. Please come see me after. We'll exchange contact info and all of that. And that goes for anyone who wants to talk more, learn more, et cetera. The next question was asked by, don't know your name, but yeah. So about what makes it easier in India? So I just want to clarify your question first. You asked what makes it easier or in India to have such kind of open engagement or discussion about sexuality and gender. Was that it? Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so there is, under Article 19 of the Indian Constitution, there is a freedom of speech and expression. There is also free freedom for, to form communities, right? So there is, a free, uh, there, there is uh, the right and the fundamental right to express what you want to your community or to your friends in general um, and um, to discuss those ideas freely. There has been 
under attack a lot in the recent times, but it still does exist. And, um, and that, that what, that's what helps um, and in, a, in, a, in a democratic country, and th that's what is the most important part, I feel. I just want to add quickly that it's been a lot easier for me to find community here. Sorry, I'll stand. Um, it's been a lot easier for me to find community here than it has for me to find community back home. Part of that is because of the stage in my life I'm at, and part of it is the fact that in India, there is a recognized thing as third gender, whereas in the US, um, where I have grown up and where I live and where my parents live, no such thing exists yet. Um, and so there is some sort of cultural imagination or cultural conception of being trans, which helps then get us to being other types of gender non-conforming. Um, and because that exists, I'm not saying it's easy to be trans in India, I'm not saying anything like that, I'm just saying that that has been my experience, is that there are strong trans communities here that exist, that also exists in the US, but that I have a harder time tapping into because a lot of the times it's not in some people's cultural imagina imagination. Yeah. Um, and just to continue on that, um, so the strong transgender community in India is also because of the cultural inclusion of transgender communities within the Indian cu uh, cultural space. Uh, at the same time, it, it is um, in a twisted way, it, 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 it is there in a twisted way because they're part of the cultural community of India, but at the same time, they're kept at the margins of the society. And the last question that I, um, that's left here, uh, oh, oh, my apologies. Pramila ji, your question on anatomy um, that you asked. Um, the, what I said, uh, Pramila ji, is from the Supreme Court judgment, um, that, that spoke, that mentioned that what lies between the thighs cannot and shall not determine a person's gender. So I was literally quoting out of the judgment. But then I see where you're coming from, that what lies between the thighs will remain a, a part of a person's identity only insofar as the person wishes to claim that identity. What the court said was, what the court said in the Nalsa judgment was, to reduce a person only to his, her, or their anatomy and genitalia is reductionist and beyond the scope of another person. So only insofar as a person, as an individual, claims to claim that, wishes to claim that identity that stems out of their anatomy, it's fine. I mean, it's well within the person's uh, uh, right. But as another person, I cannot tell a person what he or she or they are. That right, the Supreme Court said, rests only and only with the individual. The individual is the epicenter and the repository of that authority. That, that authority shall lie with you, if it's you, Pramilaji, and with nobody else. I do, not have a, I do not have a space to tell you who you are, because you alone will decide who you are. Similarly, I alone will decide who I, how I identify, and anybody else. So. Uh, I see where you're coming from, so the, here's the explanation on the, uh, on the interpretation of the Supreme Court. Um, I'll just take the last two questions quickly. Um, so one of the questions was about convenience and legitimizing um, my gender as not a form of convenience. Um, so the first thing I want you to think about, and I'm not saying this in any sort of attacking way, but just genuinely to think about is, when was the last time someone asked you to legitimize your gender? Can you remember? Has it ever happened? So I think that's the first thing, right? Like, how, who do we ask to legitimize their gender, and why do we ask that? Why is it so important to us to make sure that someone else's gender is legitimate in our eyes? That's something to think about, I think. Second thing is, um, Yes, I think there, I think that this is an argument that happens a lot of time in, with, against, or conversation that happens with trans masculine people in terms of, oh, well, now you have, um, you're just doing this to be a man so that you have privilege as a man. Or against trans women in a completely twisted um, line of thinking of, you used to have male privilege, even though that's a completely horrible argument and not true. Those are, that convenience line of thinking is where those two arguments lead. Um, but I don't think there's anything convenient about constantly being misgendered. I don't think there's anything convenient about 
never being seen for who I am, um, and for always having to explain myself. It's actually pretty damn inconvenient to constantly have to explain my gender identity. So can, at the end of the day, though, I choose to fight for that and to, um, to explain that to people. But there are days where I just dress as a woman, allow people to use she pronouns for me instead of they, them, and I just let it go because it's inconvenient to constantly have to be asserting my gender. So just things to think about. And then for the last question, um, in terms of gender, who asked me this? Yeah, in terms of something beyond going against society, um, I love that question because I think that one thing that is really a misconception about being queer, about being trans, is that we're the, the center of that is what the norm is, when really we're just living as who we are. Um, and so I, did, I do feel something that is not about going against something else, it's just about doing what's natural to me and what feels good for me. Um, and so it's not just about doing something because it is transgressive or because it is against the norm, but it's also because it is my norm and it is what feels good for me. So I'll stop there. This really has